have a video recording. Um, so welcome and glad you're here, glad for some new faces here. Um, and for those interested, if you ever miss a class but you want to catch up for what you missed, all the videos are available on the church Facebook page. So if you have Facebook, it's easy to come. I'm trying to have it that my wife downloads them and puts them on the church YouTube page also. I haven't succeeded in that just yet. She gave a, a try. It's trying to get permission from, I think, Seth, who created the, face, uh, the Facebook page to get permission for Michelle to download uh, and there's fresh the videos. Topics. Oh, thank you, okay. Brother Michael. <laughs> Gracious providing for that. But uh, the goal is that we can have fun in class like this, but that we also might learn something. For those of you who took my classes last spring, I used to have a quiz every class, and my classes used to go for an hour and a half. But I thought, you know what? I'm not sure we're really into that. So I've lessened it to one hour, and there is no quiz. But the reason of the quiz was just because I find we learn more through repetition. And when we are not getting the repetition, it kind of goes in one ear and out the other. Speaking of one ear and out the other, does anyone remember like a dominant theme I preached on? on my... Love, there you go. And so if anyone didn't get the little love keychain, apparently, I was wondering, why did I run out of these things? Because the last box arrived yesterday. Oh. There we go. So if anyone didn't have one, I do have a little box of them here. Can I get a pink one and trade my black one? Oh, you can absolutely trade that in. <laughs> so there you go. You can pass it on to someone else or give it to me later. So glad you're here. Why don't we open with a word of prayer? And who would like to grace us, grace us with praying out loud? I will. Deb, thank you. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we're, we're so grateful, Father, to have a Father like you. Um, we praise you and we thank you for, for all the ways that you take care of us and that you, you want us to live happy and healthy and whole lives. We, we praise you, Father. Thank you for this Bible study. Thank you for Pastor Steve to teach us and give us wisdom and revelation knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, let us retain everything that we're taught and use it in our daily lives. We thank you, Lord, and in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 So, for those who are here last week, how did you enjoy Pastor Nathan's little lecture? Yeah, it was interesting, wasn't it? Whoa, it's like, how do you even come up with that? Um, it was it was very intriguing. For those of you who uh, were not there, let me uh, just give you the very, very short version of it. I had him talk about Genesis chapter 9. And it's a very interesting passage. It is when um, Noah is after the flood. He gets drunk. And one of his sons, Ham, comes in and it says, sees his nakedness goes out, tells his brothers, the two brothers come in backwards, cover daddy up, daddy wakes up and is so angry and he curses his grandson, not Ham, but Ham's child. And you're like, well, that's a bizarre passage. What in the world is that supposed to mean? Because we, we know through antiquity that you know, seeing your dad naked is not like a huge crisis. So, you know, what is going on? And through studying the idioms involved, idiom is like that test was a piece of cake or um, he's not playing with a full deck. Those are idioms. Well, as it turns out, nakedness is an idiom in Hebrew for sexual relations. And so... The, the, the results of that is he either had incest with his father or more probable slept with his mother and had a child with her, which is why daddy's cursing the grandson, not him. Now, 
for those of you who weren't there, you're like, what in creation <laughs> are you talking about? All I would say is watch the video and you'll get a, an image of that. But it was really interesting, and I, and I love my brother Nathan. He's a sharp guy, and um, I was so glad to take him out of finance and place him into ministry where he belonged. And he is uh, thriving there. He's well-loved at the church I came from. And this is the fourth time he visited me here. So he'll be here again sometime, and I might even have him preach some Sunday. But I really enjoyed that. Well, we're going to look now at probably the most important chapter in Genesis to affect your life directly and my life directly. And so with that in mind, let's look at Genesis chapter 3. Now I'm going to read the whole uh, chapter and I'm going to read it myself so people online can hear the scripture read. If you read, they won't hear a thing. Um, so we read this. Now the serpent was more crafty than, than the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and that you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called out to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit of the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man is now to become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take from the tree of life and to eat and live forever. So the Lord banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. All right. So that is a dramatic passage and one that impacts us all. If there was to be given a title for the whole chapter, it's really what's printed here. The Fall. It is the fall of humanity. And you look at everything that happens in the world. For example, 
I understand uh, Iran just released 100 ballistic missiles against Israel this morning. Um, and you look at this back and forth, this hatred one for another, that uh, sometimes we'll say somebody's uh, nasty response is justified because somebody was nasty to them, but we look all, to, all together at the brokenness of this world, and we know it's not right. We, we can smell it. We sense it. Christianity argues that it is all related to the fall, that God created this world perfect, but after the fall, that brokenness, that woundedness affected everything, um, from disease, from uh, lifespans, to uh, pr pretty much anything that's wrong with the world, including the natural disasters like Hurricane Helen. All of it is like the world was damaged when that happened. And we talked last time, two weeks ago, why did God put that tree there? You know, you kind of wish that tree was not even there. And, you know, philosophers and scholars and theologians have looked at it and, and debated among themselves why. And usually the answer they come up with is that God wanted a people that had the free will to love and obey him. Because other than that, it would be a bunch of robots just loving and obey him. But he wanted that genuine uh, affection that we have the free will to choose to give him. And so we start and we look back at this and, and I have a few pictures here because this was an artist rendition of the garden. You know, and the one difference of the garden is they do got clothes on here. <laughs> they cleaned it up for Sunday school. But if it was true to chapter two, they were naked and felt no shame. I have often thought of that phrase because I kind of wish that they were naked and felt no shame. I understand it's a metaphor, but the metaphor is a powerful one because you can live with a husband or a wife for 65, 70 years, but there will still be some things that you might keep in your head and not say to your spouse. Let's say you had a dream of which you were with an old boyfriend or an old girlfriend. You don't necessarily bring that up at coffee in the morning. <laughs> oh yeah, I dreamed of the guy I dated when I was in high school. It just popped into your head. There are certain things we kind of still keep to ourselves. But there is a place, and I think heaven will ultimately be that place, where we can be naked and feel no shame. Because it won't be a question of being judged by everything that comes in our mind. There will be just a beautiful wholeness of community. And here's another picture of uh, Eden. This guy does happen to be naked, but he's sitting very modestly, so we're, we're okay. But you see, what I like what these artists did is the burst of color, you know, because we, when we think of, you know, what our imagination might be, what was Eden like, what would heaven be like? We don't think monochrome. We think beauty. We think wonder. And so we see that, but there is this one tree and there is this serpent hanging around it. Now, just a few things. What does the serpent actually look like? There is all different kinds of speculation. And one of the reasons we know it's not a traditional serpent is because when God curses the serpent, that's when he's gonna be crawling along the ground. Yeah. So, so he was up like this all the time? There are some people think that he could walk, and obviously he speaks, yeah. you know, in, in terms of what's going on. But some people think he was a flying creature. There's all different kinds of speculation. One thing I would say, when I bump into a snake, I jump. I do not go, oh, can I pet your snake? <laughs> you know, like I do with a little flurry doggy. I go jogging often at six in the morning, and there's this man who walks his good-sized poodle. And it's the kind of poodle that's like, has all the hair around the face, but they like trim the body nice and uh, short. And you know, anyway, he always pulls over to the side as I'm jogging to let me go by. And the dog just sits down nice, obeys the master perfectly. 
I always want to go up and like run my fingers through <laughs> that bushy hair around the head, but I never have that feeling with a snake. <laughs> you know, once, once uh, it was not too long ago, it was about a year and a half ago, actually two years ago, I was preaching at my old church and I was preaching on this passage. I went to Pets, Pet Supplies Plus, I think it's called. Anyway, one of pet stores and I bought a snake. And I found out, I did ask if they're returnable. And they are, you know, but I, I brought it just for a prop on Sunday morning. You know, I am a pastor who likes props. And I haven't brought a snake here yet. But, but I, yeah, please don't, please don't. But I brought that snake up and I held it in my hand. Now I knew it was the kind of snake that's not gonna, you know, but even as I'm speaking, I don't love snakes. It's was winding itself around my arm. And even though I knew this was not a scary snake, it was still freaking me out as I'm preaching. And as I'm preaching, I'm saying, Steve, this was a very bad decision <laughs> to bring. But it, it carried the point. But I want you to know, you can let your imagination run with you a little bit as to what this snake was like. But how do we know that this snake is the devil, is Satan, because it doesn't mention those two words in this passage. But what we find is that as the rest of the story of the Bible continues, we see that they are indeed one and the same. And um, let's see here. What happens is this. So does anyone remember Pastor Nathan mentioning this word last week? Yeah. He loves these kinds of things. So what is catawampus? Oh. Janet, you had a good... Just, just off kilter. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So what is catawampus is we move from this to this. In other words, we went from Disorder. the place of perfection to the place that we find ourselves here. By the way, if you ever read the, the, uh, excuse me, the, the Lord of the Rings, and uh, or saw the movies, you know, the Lord of the Rings. The image of the orcs and the image of the trenches was J.R.R. Tolkien visualizing World War I and life in the trenches. And so when Peter Jackson is trying to create these movies, he actually, because he knew this impacted J.R.R. Tolkien is how he pronounces his name, he looked to see what was the images that Tolkien was visualizing. And thus you see these gruesome battle scenes in the Lord of the Rings mirroring World War I. But I grabbed that picture only because that is where we find ourselves. Yes, and there are periods of peace. There are periods, thank God, where there aren't nations at war. But we know always there's something around this world bad happening almost every day. Um, whether it's hunger, whether it's you know uh, war, or just animosity and cruelty, we know it's there. But anyway, I thought I'd make use of Pastor Nathan's word, cattywampus. <laughs> Some people say kittywampus. Which if you think about it, it's cat and kitty. You know, yes, right? yes, yes, yes. I, one, I can I, see that. Yeah, but it does have the C-A-T-A. -A. I, I did verify the spelling <laughs> to make sure I had it correct. But here is where we get that the connection. This is Revelation. So you guys who are in Pastor Seth's class, which most of you are, you'll get to this. And he actually quoted, I think, last week's class. But the great dragon was hurled down that ancient serpent's called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Yes. Pastor, so when you asked us, um, he was a, the, the serpent was a creature before he was uh, made to crawl on the ground. Yes. And because we already do kind of know we're talking Satan and the devil, yes. or Satan or the devil, I mean, whatever we're going to call him, um, wouldn't we think then, and it goes along with this paragraph, right. that he's an angel because Satan was a beautiful, powerful angel before he was hurled to the earth. There is a funny, funny cartoon, okay. uh, which my daughter sent me, and she said, you know how when an angel meets you, you hear the phrase, peace be still, 
or do not be afraid. And the image was, if you could imagine bumping into like Isaiah, a seraphim, with two wings they were flying, with two wings they were covering, um, technically their private parts, and two wings they were covering their face, um, and they were calling one to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is, and then if you saw the depiction of this, we would probably be afraid too. Yeah. So beauty may be in the eye of a heavenly being okay. because uh, of how that un unfolds. There is a passage in Isaiah which speaks of Lucifer, which is another name we often give for Satan, but Lucifer is actually a beautiful name. Yeah. It speaks of the, the illuminated one. It's the, the, the light. Um, and that passage in Isaiah may refer to Satan, may not. There's some debate about that because it's not overtly, but this one is overt. And this one is an important one because we see Satan, the devil, serpent, all in the same paragraph. And so when you read later on in the Hebrew Bible, for example, in the beginning of Job, Satan had just finished traveling around and the Lord says to Satan, hey, did you check out my servant Job? And then Satan says, ah, he only follows you because you protect him. And then the Lord says, we'll take all his stuff away. And then eventually, you know, the health is taken away. But the idea of the devil and Satan, the very name means the accuser. The accuser. Or can mean the deceiver. The deceiver. And with that in mind, that seems to be what we have here in this passage. He is the deceiver. He's wanting a, a, a choice to be made by Eve that is going to be detrimental. Some have argued out of jealousy because he saw that humanity was the apple of God's eye. And he did not want that to be. And so he takes this approach, all this, by the way, is his motivations, is speculative. We don't know exactly why. What I'm saying, though, at this point, he probably didn't look like the scary serpent. He may have been rather charming, yeah. rather handsome. That's why she fell for it. Yes, because of, you know, just the way he came across. And so let's look at that as it unfolds. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord had made. So when you're wondering how you deal with Satan in your own life, this is a good word to keep in mind. What's he like? Crafty. 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 And crafty can go, you can have positive crafty, but I think most of the time we have a negative connotation with crafty. Sneaky. By the way, say it again. Sneaky. Sneaky. Um, by the way, have any of you been to England? Yeah. When you were there, did you have a chance to sit in Parliament at all? Yes. One of the things that catches you off guard when you go to Parliament is you'll hear a speaker stand up proposing a scheme. Oh, oh. And in our language, scheme is, <laughs> I'm scheming. But for them, it's proposing a bill. You know, and they don't even think a negative connotation of it. But for us, we're like, he's actually admitting it. He's scheming. <laughs> These politicians are all alike. At least in England, they're honest about it. <laughs> but um, anyway, this is a, something to keep in mind about craftiness. Out of curiosity, what are some of the crafty things that, that Satan does in our world? In our Boulder cities, Las Vegas? Like maybe on Sunday morning when you think, oh, I'm just really tired. I probably should. That's a good one. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. You well, know, and then an argument you know ensues between you yes, and you. Yes. <laughs> my uh, my wife, you know, went to Boulder High School, and so our entire marriage, we always would come to Boulder City every year, and so every year I would come, and we'd of course take the kids to see the flashing lights of Las Vegas. Now, you could go to any of my four kids to this day and ask this question, what are all these flashing lights for? And my kids would respond in unison to separate us from our money. 
Excellent. Excellent. That's why they built those pretty lights. <laughs> to take your back. Yes. Um, yes. Our mind's a battlefield, so I think a lot of our thoughts can be from him too. Oh. That we think that I think there are all kinds of things. Um, when I worked for Amtrak, I worked in Chicago, and there were two paths I could go to where I had my car parked, because yeah. I had to drive, park a mile away. One path had all these adult bookstores. <laughs> the other path just had like CVS and Walgreens and all those kinds of things. I cannot tell you how many times I felt the enemy saying, this way shorter. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I remember the proverb that is in the Bible. It says, don't even go down that street. That's a point of wisdom. Just avoid that street. Mm -hmm. And that's the craftiness of Satan. You know, the craftiness was, it's shorter. Want to get to your car faster? Want to get home sooner? Oh, it's going to work out great for you. Especially, especially in the wintertime. Yes, exactly. When Chicago is known, even though they say it's Windy City because of political talk, it's really windy too. <laughs> and that cold wind just kind of blows through you. But that keeps us in mind as to who this is. And now here is the quintessential question that Satan likes. Did God really say? that you must not eat of any tree in the garden. What happens when you hear that kind of question? Make you doubt. Yeah, yeah maybe. Maybe he didn't. You know, what, what is going on there? But listen to the response. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Now, let me show you what God said and what she says. Chop, you see, and the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from every tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. But then what does she say? You must not touch it. She adds touch. This is important for a couple reasons. Humanity has the tendency to add to God's instructions. Mm -hmm. To add to God's instructions. When I grew up, I grew up in a conservative Baptist Pentecostal home. And for example, my mother, she never wore jewelry because she grew up where jewelry made you a Jezebel. It made you a sinful woman. The funny thing is when my mother turned 60, she said, I'm getting my ears pierced. Oh. <laughs> you know? and, and she did. And, uh, you know, she kind of, because they would take a passage and elaborate more into it to make it that, you know, because there are passages that speak of a woman dressing modestly, but not nuancing, you know, every ounce of, you know, jewelry you might wear. And in the same sense, I was, grew up where you don't dance because dancing, you gyrate your body and it can cause to sexual sin and, and things like that. So I never went to my prom. Um, and I was trying to honor my parents and honor the Lord. But in both those things, it's adding to what the Lord says. And it's not unusual for communities groups to add stuff to what the Bible says that was never there in the first place. And you know what I've learned? What, what, a counselor came up to me at church one day and said, Pastor Steve, you could preach about grace every week and it would not be enough because we all carry a weight of guilt. And she's referring to her clients who come in carrying a weight of guilt and they just never quite get over that weight of guilt. It's funny how things stick with us. When I was in New York uh, for the sale of my mother's home, I had lunch with a friend, a, a woman. Uh, she's about 80 years old. She said to me, her mother once told her that when she was 16, you look like your Aunt Helen. And she, every, everyone knew Aunt Helen looked ugly. Oh. And so here she is 80 years old. She's still, she's still wounded 
from her mom saying, you look like your Aunt Helen. And it's funny, you never, it's not easy to let go of these things. This is just to remind you that she was adding to what the Lord would say, was saying to her. So we, we go on and we read, You will not certainly die, the said to the woman, for the Lord knows that when you eat, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, a couple things with this phrase. Are they going to die? Well, not the day that they eat it. And interesting, that word, the day, is not in the Lord's statement. He's just saying, you will die. You know, it's like it begins a clock that will, that will end your life. Satan's thinking very temporal. Oh, you're not going to die today. Okay. And it, it sounds intriguing. Now, I want you to think for a moment. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Do you look back favorably at your childhood when things were innocent? That, that, I feel these days, everything in this world is trying to keep our children from being innocent and, and yes. moving them Amen. to know the difference between good and evil. My, you may disagree with my wife on this, but she made a decision. She walks into Target, and it's June, which is Pride Month. And there are rainbows everywhere. To which my little girl asked Michelle, why are all these rainbows here? And Michelle responded, they're celebrating the Noatic Covenant. That's when God sent a rainbow to remind him that he would never destroy the world again by a flood. To which somebody who's grown up will say, that's not why those rainbows are there. <laughs> To which my wife would have responded to you, Target doesn't get to tell my kids about things that I do not feel that they're ready to be told about. Right. And so yeah. I will yeah. own that. And my, Michelle was a master at this. <laughs> she really was. Once I was preaching on Rahab the prostitute, you know, and again, my little daughter goes up, Mommy, what's a prostitute? Yeah. Now she's like seven or six at the time. And Michelle, she's just a brilliant woman. Without a moment's hesitation, she said, that's when you, that's when you pay somebody to pretend to be your wife. And she goes, oh, okay. Yeah. End of conversation. Right. It was true, <laughs> but <laughs> she didn't have to give the salacious details. The reason I'm saying this is because God relished his people to live in a state of innocence and we sometimes value the opposite now i am a movie aficionado you probably have picked that up already but there was a movie that came out i don't know 15 20 years ago called life is beautiful it is a comedy about the holocaust how is that possible well it is about basically being Jewish in Rome or in Italy somewhere and uh, this is the movie and what it looked like but if you notice there's this little boy and so the mother is taken away to where the women were taken to I think on a train she would never come back from and he hid his son in the barracks that he was brought to and he told his son we're in a contest, and if you can stay hidden, we could win. And the kid says, well, what would we win? We'll win an army tank. And um, the entire movie is about this father protecting his son's innocence in the midst of this horrible war. This scene where you see him doing this funny walk, he's being led away to be killed. But when he turns, he knows his son is hiding down this alley. He does this exaggerated walk because he knows we're going to win this contest, you know. And, and the whole thing is to protect him. And then when the Americans come rolling in, 
This is the face of the kid when he sees the army tank, and this is the last scene when one of the American soldiers gives him a ride on the armor tank, and the kid is, we win, we won. Now, we know, the viewer, that life was awful. But what you see in the film is that they, these parents, particularly that dad, did everything for that boy to see life is beautiful. And that is the whole, you might say, punchline of the film and, and what is going on. And so I, I, I just wanna ask you this question because when you were eight, you know, some of you, I probably many of you dealt with what I did, duck and cover because there might be a nuclear war. You know, I, you know, we had to go into the hall and go like this, stay away from the glass, as if we're gonna survive a nuke, you know. But you know, but that was kind of a shaking of the innocence that I had as a child to know that life is not that great, and then I would come home and I'd have a nightmare at night. Because I remember they told me that the uh, the signal of an air raid would be a prolonged whistle um, that would be. And in New York, it's all volunteer fire departments, and the way they draw the firefighters is they put this whistle on, and this whistle would go off late at night after I was in bed, and I would say, Mom, Dad, and I want them to pray with me because I thought it was an air raid. You know, I, I wasn't sure. It was like the cracks of my innocence was in that. I, I say this because being like God feels tempting, doesn't it? You know, like uh, knowing the difference between good and evil. And of course, as our kids grow older, we teach them that step by step. But to have that thrust upon you, as my wife wanted to protect my kids, as you probably wanted to protect your kids, God, our Heavenly Father, did not want that thrust upon them. But you say, well, then why was the tree in the garden? The argument is usually given that we would have free will and that we would choose to obey him. And when God brought us to new stages, we would be you know, ready to move on. A lot of philosophical stuff in here that I can't say I fully understand and, and I wanna to pretend to fully understand. But at this point, I know that the world is now broken. So verse six, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for the gaining of wisdom, she took some and ate it and gave some to her husband who was with her. He ate it and the eyes of them were opened and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. It's funny, it says they're supposed to be wiser You'd think, I think God will notice that we're wearing clothes right now. I'm not sure how wise they were in that process. And this, this whole element, to me, is just a, a very sad paragraph because it reminds us of where we are today, you know, in terms of our hiding from each other and, and feeling kind of a lonely existence that we kind of crave that somebody would know us completely and still love us. Um, Gloria Gaither wrote this poem. I've said it in church. It's just a marvelous little line. But Gloria Gaither's poem was, I am loved, I am loved. I can risk loving you because the one who knows me best loves me most. And that's a beautiful truth. The one who knows all the dirt loves you more than you could ever imagine. And so the more we come to grips with that, the one who knows everything about me loves me, therefore I can take a risk and love you because I know I am loved and lovable. Very powerful, very powerful. So the New Testament makes a big deal that as an Adam, all sin. It doesn't say as in Eve, all sin. Why do you think that is? Well, it goes back to this verse. 
She gave it to her husband, who was with her. Who was with her the whole time. The whole time. Absolutely. Didn't speak up, didn't say, wait a minute. And there is an element, the New Testament theologians will call this, Adam is the federal head of the family. Um, he's the one who was created first and bears that responsibility. He was the one given all these tasks and instructions by God. And he was instructed to teach his wife and to share that. And she was not there when the instruction came. So in other words, she is saying what she heard from Adam. So who is the one who gave the bad information? Don't even touch it. Apparently that would have been Adam. Yeah. So and so he is the ultimate responsible one for what is taking place. And quite honestly, we understand this in our world. When you're walking through a Target, as an example, and you see a kid acting wild, we don't go, what a bad kid. We go, why is this parent not exercising parental responsibility? We kind of understand that that kid is only acting out because mom and dad have set them up that way. Another funny Target story. So my daughter is acting out and you know, you know how they have these clothes hanger things and she's going inside of the clothes and, and she says really loud, get over here now. And my daughter, even louder than Michelle says, don't hurt me, mommy, please don't hurt me. And everyone in the whole store is looking to see the parental abuser. <laughs> and she's like, ah, she's okay, she's okay, I'm not touching her. <laughs> But I, I just wanted to connect that. Adam has the ultimate or responsibility, um, both biblically, this is what the scripture teaches us, but as we see the story unfold. Then man and, heard, uh, and his wife heard the sound, it's verse eight, of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Couple things, I mentioned this the first week, Lord God, Lord is Yahweh, God is Elohim. So it is the personal name of God, the name Yahweh, which can be translated roughly, I am who I am, I will be who I will be. And Elohim just means God, like we would use the name God. So the Lord God, he was walking in the cool of the garden, uh, cool of the day. Pause there for a moment because that is an image that don't you crave and wish? <laughs> Honey, I'll be out. I'm walking with the Lord. Yeah. Oh, to say that? <laughs> when I was at uh, 11, 11th grade, I went to work at a camp called Word of Life, upstate New York. And uh, my parents came to visit me. And it's a Christian camp. And they came to where they knew I was, had my cabin. And uh, my friend was sitting on the, 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 the uh, the front of it, porch. And they said, hey, uh, do you know my, our son, Steve? And uh, he said, oh yes, I do know him well. I said, do you know where he is? And this is their, his response. He's walking with Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason is I told my friend Jim that I'm gonna be having my quiet time in the woods. Um, you know, it's, uh, I wanna nurture it and things like that. But the way Jim said it, made my parents burst out of laughter. <laughs> oh, he's walking with Jesus. <laughs> but humor aside, we love that image because, I mean, we, I think, and I would encourage you, do walk in the cool of the night with the Lord. Tell him everything that's on your mind. But just that imagined, you know, the day will come, friends, when we will do that again, where Jesus will be your next door neighbor. In fact, many of you know John 14. In my father's house are many mansions. If it weren't, that's the King James. The, the, the Greek actually says, in my father's house are lots of rooms. And if you could think, you don't live next door to the Lord. You live next room. Yeah. And from my childhood memory of hearing the whistle and crying for my mother and father, of course there'll be no more crying in heaven, but just to know 
that the Lord God is right in this house with me. This is the flavor of that in the cool of the night. And the Lord was waiting for his normal walk with Adam and Eve. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? This is a rhetorical question. God does indeed know. He will do another rhetorical question in Genesis 4-9 when he says to Cain, where is your brother Abel? And, of course, Abel had been killed. The Lord often uses questions to help us. Like, for example, me walking in Chicago to the parking lot, you can hear the question of the Lord in my mind. Which road might be the wiser one for you to walk on? And what, just the question, huh, you know, wakes you up and you realize, no, I think the Lord knows which way I need to, to go here. And keep that in mind. If you ever wonder if the Lord is speaking to you or not, just listen to the questions that pop into your mind. You'd be surprised how much the Lord is talking to you by bringing up a rhetorical question for you to then make a good choice over. Because like then, which he's given them free will, he's giving you free will, but often the way of going about it is by asking a question. Is this the wise thing to do? So we move on. And he said, he answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Who told you you were naked? Again, another rhetorical question. He knows the answer. Have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you gave me. Isn't this so much like us? <laughs> to blame any possibility you know, and it's such a, it's a grown-up thing to do when you acknowledge that you screwed up yourself. <laughs> and what I, I shared with you guys, I bought this new used car. I have this Chevy, uh, sorry, a Hyundai, um, I forget the model. Uh, anyway, I bought it. It's about six inches wider than my previous car. And it's, it's not even a week old and I pull it to my garage and I scrape the side of it. Um, the insurance company told me the repair was $2,800. My share was 500 to get this thing fixed. It was a scratch on the side. I mean, it was a good scratch. I don't yeah. want to pretend it wasn't. I thought hard and fast how I could blame Michelle for this. <laughs> oh, I, I'm not just telling you guys yeah. the way what goes through my mind. The, Jeremiah says the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know it? I, I want to tell you guys another one. I told, I confessed it to Pastor Seth already. So I will not be here on Sunday. I'm going to Florida. Um, it was a trip planned for a long time. But I thought, this is, this is Steve's flesh working here. In light of the hurricane, I could have said to the church, I won't be in church on Sunday. I'm going to be visiting friends in Florida. And everyone, everyone would automatically think, oh, what a good man visiting his friends in Florida. You know, and you, you would fill in the blank. But it would be a total lie. <laughs> My friends that are visiting weren't in the path of the hurricane. <laughs> and it wouldn't have been an issue. And I'm staying on the east coast of Florida. The hurricane came on. My point is, and the reason I told Seth, is the heart is desperately wicked. <laughs> Who can know it? So when Eve says, um, you know, I'm sorry, when Adam says, it was the woman, don't just point to her, we do this kind of thing ourselves. And of course, you know, it goes on when God says to Eve, well, what do you do here? And she responds, it was the serpent. And, uh, you know, everyone's passing the buck, no, no responsibility. Verse 13, then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? 
the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord said to the serpent. Now, I'm going to teach you a big word. Proto-evangelium. Proto-evangelium. This is the first sign of the gospel in the Bible. In other words, we are now seeing the beginning of the good news. In the middle of a curse, what God is saying is that he's going to fix things. So this is called proto or first evangelist gospel. This is the first gospel. And so we read this. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl in your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. So somehow the animal is changing, you know. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. You will strike his heel. I would say most women seem to have this enmity between snakes and, uh, you know, themselves. But here is the gospel. The offspring of woman will crush your head. That is the death blow. And you will strike the offspring of woman's heel. That is not a death blow. It is a wound. And this ultimately points to... Calvary, where Satan is crushed ultimately, but this striking of the heel is the cross. Now, I was jogging once around my house in New York, and I jogged by St. Mary's, which is a big Catholic church. I was leaning on the, the railing, you know, because I was out of my breath, and there is the statue of Mary. St. Mary's, of course they're going to have a statue of Mary. But because I was huffing and puffing, I was kind of looking down and saw something I never saw before. Look at her foot. Right Stepping on the This is all over in Catholicism. Nobody ever notices it because everyone's so theologically illiterate. But let me give you another one. Wow. We see the picture of Mary. And we don't even look down. But this is great theology. Now it is the offspring of Mary that saves Mary. She is, through her offspring, crushing Satan's head. Yeah. Now, let me see some theological words on this. This is Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way, death came to all people because all have sin. Sin came into the world through one man. That man's name? Adam. Earth. That's what the Adam means. And 1 Corinthians 15, 2, 22. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits then, when he comes to those who belong to him. So it's an Adam, the brokenness came. Through Christ, Paul will later call the second Adam, the perfect one, the one who got it right. And then, look at the end of Romans. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under his feet. Grace to our, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. That's how he ends the whole book of Romans. Now, I want to show you one of the more com uh, the, uh, controversial passages in Scripture. But I want to give you a new way to potentially interpret it. So here is the passage. 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 14. A woman should learn in quietness and in full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. She must be quiet, for Adam was formed first and then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women shall be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Now, I, I love 
debating and discussing women in ministry. I am, you know, I am a big advocate of women serving in the church. Um, just speaking briefly to that, in fact, Carl and I had some vibrant conversations on this very topic. But where it says a woman should learn in quietness, that is the only imperative, imperative is a command, in the entire paragraph. The only command is let the women learn. Previously, women weren't allowed to learn. But when I'm debating with somebody, I always end up, when they're trying to make a case that Paul says women can't teach, I say, can you explain to me how the, what the end of that passage means? But women shall be saved through childbirth. And eventually they say, I have no idea what that means. So then I push back and say, so you're wanting to make normative for the church a passage you can't even explain. And that usually causes them to like back off a little bit. But Dr. Walter Kaiser pointed something out, which I thought was so cool when he pointed it out. That the article is present in Greek, but never translated. This is the way that word could be written when you, the article is the word the. But women will be saved through the birth of the child. Now that makes complete sense because Mary is given birth to the child who saves her. And then I included the section from Luke. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? What an amazing statement of faith Elizabeth gives. She's greeting a younger woman who's pregnant and says, You're pregnant with my Lord. Unbelievable statement, you know, when you see it. The reason I'm showing you this, though, is not to discuss women in ministry. is because I think that interpretation by Dr. Walter Kaiser of the Timothy, but women shall be saved through the birth of the child. In other words, it's true. Eve did screw up, and in turn, Adam screwed up. But that serpent, when he received the curse, I will place enmity between you and the woman, she will strike that, excuse me, the child will strike your head for the death blow and you will strike his heel. Is the woman shall be saved through the birth of the child, through the Christ child, through the Messiah. Um, once again, kind of a bookend of what's going on in this passage. Now, he's not done. This is tiny font, so it's hard to read. I have one final point I want to give on this. And so, to the woman, he said, oh, your pains in childbirth will be severe. Then he goes on. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree, which I commanded you, you must not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. Though your, um, excuse me here, hold on a second. Of course, because uh, through painful toil, you will eat food from it, all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles and you will eventually end up back in the ground. People have said that work is cursed because of this. And that's not true. If I recall to, uh, you, uh, okay. Oh, here it is. It's in, it's in the passage. Look at uh, Genesis 2.15. The Lord took man and put him in the garden to work it and take care of it. Work is not cursed. The results of the earth not working and growing things is what's cursed. I want to say this because you can with joy work. Work is blessed of God. And I think the happiest people on the face of this earth are people who work. You know, there's, there's a phrase, you probably have heard it, that if you like what you do, you don't have to work a day in your life. But the, the simple point of that is work is good. I mean, for me, when I am getting up to preach, I, I know people who are like, don't even get me near the stage. You know, it's, they don't want anything to do with it. Or if they do have to go up there, it's like pulling teeth. For me, it's, it's an absolute joy. 
Or when I go, like when you visit somebody in the hospital with cancer, it's not easy. But for me, I know I'm where God meant me to be. One of my most painful days and one of my most, most beautiful days was when a dear person in the church, her husband committed suicide, age 44. Mm -hmm. Obviously horrible. And I sat with this woman as her six-year-old and eight-year-old were getting off the bus from school and she had to tell her kids, Daddy will not be home again. And it happened while they were in school. And so I was there sitting with her when we told the kids. And I thought to myself, as I'm sitting there, there's no other place I'd rather be than with this woman when she needs me most. And that I am honored to be there. Now, is it painful? Absolutely, it's gut-wrenching. But it was funny, I walked away from that horrible day and saying, this day was better than any day I worked with Amtrak. Mm -hmm. Because with Amtrak, it was a job. And I had good days and I had bad days, like we all do. Mm -hmm. But being with that woman, with the kids, it was, a, it was a privilege, it was a calling. And when you're working, it's blessed. The curse was not work itself. The curse was the results that we got to work extra hard to get food. One last thing, I wanna go back to the woman. Uh, verse 16, I will make your pains in childbirth very severe. The painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. The way it was created in the garden was that Eve was created to be an equal helper. The curse is everything you see bad about patriarchy when men are acting inappropriate and stupid, <laughs> I would say. That's part of the curse. In other words, when you are a believer, we want to aim for the garden, not the curse. And so when you, as a believer, honor your spouse and treat her with love and respect, as Adam did Eve before the fall, that is God's ideal. The curse about men just running, you know, running over women in hurtful and cruel ways, that's part of the fall. It is a result of the fall. But when we are redeemed, that is not the way we are to be. We are to be at Genesis chapter 2 when they had this bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and that Eve is the help helper, not somebody under your thumb. Um, so it's just it, valuable and helpful to know. To wrap things up, the end of the Bible. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious... I will give right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And then later at the end of the book, blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. The Bible ends with the tree of life and it began with the tree of life. In the beginning, we lost the tree of life. At the end, we regain. And how do we regain it? clean robes. How does Revelation describe how we get these clean robes? Surprisingly, dipped in blood. The blood of the Lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, going through this passage and seeing some very, very important truths about the brokenness of our world. Indeed, our brokenness. Father, I look in the mirror and I see my own choices to deceive, to act inappropriate. And Lord, I long for the day that I will be completely whole. I long for the day, Lord, that we will be naked and feel no shame. But Father, till that day comes, we pray that our, our lives, our families, our church would be moving closer and closer to that redemption of which we long for, and we receive through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Interesting Thank you. chapter. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.